Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for September 23rd, 2019. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Jupiter Security at Lawrence Livermore National Lab with Thomas Mendoza. Thomas is a staff computer scientist at LLNL, uh, working for Livermore's Computing HPC Center on Web Ar Architecture and Security. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Um, if you click on the little chat, uh, icon, the chat window will pop up and then you can type questions there. And we are planning on leaving time for the end of the presentation to answer questions as well. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Thomas. Thomas, welcome. Hi, good morning, everybody. We can hear you, you sound great. Okay, perfect. I will go ahead and Start sharing my screen, just a moment here. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yep, looks good. All right, um, so welcome, yes, as, thank you for that introduction, Jeanette. My name is Thomas Mendoza. Um, I work at Lawrence of Amore National Lab. Uh, and those of you who are keen to notice my uh, slide um, presentation date is out of date, and that's in part because these have been approved a while ago, um, and it's hard to get things reapproved. So, uh, I'm giving a talk that I gave for the Jupiter Community Workshop that happened a little while ago at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, and it's just going to be a brief overview of what what our Jupiter deployment at Lawrence Livermore National Lab looks like. And it's really hard to uh, avoid security. So really, this is a security talk around Jupiter. OK, so, so the motivation for setting up Jupiter um, at, in LC was that we were repeatedly asked by LC users for Jupyter notebooks. There's a lot of scientists who use them, a lot of people who share their work. I'm sure that a lot of you know that. Uh, and we repeatedly had to tell them no. Um, Livermore Computing is generally suspicious of web server-based applications. Um, and that's because, as I've listed here, that they're a very easy way to bypass Unix permissions. If I start, for instance, the simple Python HTTP server in my home directory, now I've just given everybody access to my home directory. Um, and so on a multi-tenant machine like we have in the HPC Center, uh, that just, that won't fly. And so anything that happens to spin up a web server, we're worried about what kind of security model they have in place. Um, so that being said, uh, it is a very useful tool. Jupyter is a useful tool and people wanted it. So we, we looked to see whether or not we, we could make this a possibility and what kind of risks were out there. So um, first I'll, I'll demonstrate one of the risks that we came across. So this was um, my nosy demo. So what I'm gonna do is in this bottom terminal here is I'm gonna start a Jupyter notebook. This is just running on my desktop. Um, and then I'm gonna start Okay, so now I have a notebook up and running. And now I'm in this terminal in the top right corner, I'm gonna start my nosy Python script. And now I'm gonna run through some execution. So I'm gonna run through this first cell here. Um, and you'll notice that the top cell or the top terminal window, and hopefully that's visible. If not, um, please let me know. And you'll see that there's a bunch of output in this top terminal cell. Um, and in part, what I'm doing is I've, I've bound to 
the active um, socket that one of the, or one of the sockets, Jupyter Notebooks use five of them for communication, sending commands across the wire, uh, et cetera. So I've bound to that and I'm just listening. And as you can see, here's, here's one of my code cells and this contrived username and password uh, curl request that I send to example.com. Now, you know, some, some folks, this is a contrived example. However, it's not inconceivable that people connect to databases or put some sort of sensitive information into a cell. Um, this, was, this was sort of the unacceptable risk to us because anybody who is on the same host where you're running a notebook uh, can now do this to you. They can see everything that you happen to be putting in, all of the output cells, um, and that was just a, it, that, too, too much of a risk. And if you think about modern web as well, you know, there was a point in time where we would serve things over HTTP. <clears throat> and now, whether or not a site happens to need it, we serve those sites over HTTPS because it just, there have been so many numerous exploits that even if you can't think of one that may affect you at the time, um, it's not to say that it is impossible. So, so that, was, that was the risk that we wanted to mitigate. We wanted to keep user data scoped to the users that, that started that, um, their notebook. Okay, and so I was gonna take a little time on this because um, our Jupyter deployment, how we deploy Jupyter Notebooks is a little bit different than how um, they might look elsewhere. So if you're familiar with the tool Jupyter Hub, it is a tool for launching individual Jupyter Notebooks as users. And the way that it's generally deployed is there's a single Jupyter Hub host and it launches individual notebooks on, sorry, on, uh, <coughs> on the same host. Uh, and that's fine if you happen to be doing your work on a single host. Uh, but in our HPC Center, you know, there are a number of different clusters that users want to use. And so we've created, or I set up this model to where we would launch on various login nodes of user's choice. So um, as you'll see in the top tier, we have a single web server. And this is, this is where the hub itself is hosted. This is the hub authenticator, the, the configurable HTTP proxy. This is all of the things that manage the individual notebooks. And when we go to spawn a notebook, I will present to the, the client all, uh, a list of hosts that they happen to have access to. Um, they select that and then I build an SSH tunnel out to the login node of their choice, um, start a notebook, and, um, and connect back to it in the hub. And to avoid the, the issue and the, the exploit that you saw on the previous screen, I set up an ephemeral set of certificates that gets signed and uh, released to the notebook at that time um, to encrypt traffic out to that notebook. So from the browser, all the way out to the notebook, running on the remote login node. I have a set of certs, so SSL is, is established in each direction. Every component that talks to um, another component is doing so over SSL, and it's also verifying those certs. So if, uh, if for instance, I took the, note, the certs that I gave this notebook, notebook for user one, and attempted to talk to the notebook for user two, this actually wouldn't work because of the way that I set up the certificate authorities. These um, certificate validation would fail between notebooks. So I couldn't, I couldn't try to steal notebook 
user two's information using the certs from notebook user one. And that, that particular change has been uploaded and upstream to Jupyter Hub, but I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So to finish this diagram here, um, the, last, the last piece is that, you know, we don't really want to be running any heavy computation on a, on a login node. Uh, so we have, I've been working with another colleague to, to um, formalize this solution. He has, we have one that is, um, requires some manual steps at the moment. Um, but essentially we launch the kernel, the notebook kernel into an allocation. Uh, and then that allows us to steer either an active simulation or some set of work out in a batch cluster allocation. Uh, and I, I, can, I can revisit this diagram a little bit later. Oh, and one last piece here, and, uh, which is this IPC socket, because between a notebook and a kernel, this, this communication route also needs to be secured. Uh, and for us, we were happy to work with IPC uh, and a number of kernels actually just support that. These are, those are internal procedure calls. So this is, uh, instead of using a TCP socket, this communicates over a Unix domain socket, um, which is scoped to a user. So basically this gives us an, a complete and closed route out to a single notebook and makes sure that a notebook is scoped to an individual user and can eventually give us a route all the way out to a batch cluster. And so that's, that's very in the very near term that we're working on that. Um, and so as I mentioned, these are, these are sort of the modifications that, that I made to um, Jupyter Hub in order to make this work. There's the internal SSL modification. This is actually, as I mentioned, upstreamed in Jupyter Hub. Uh, it's in, in, the, in the code as far as the 1.0 release. Um, and so you can actually turn that on. And I would recommend if, if it's feasible to turn that setting on, uh, if you happen to have a, a more complicated setup like our own, um, it's still possible to do, but it requires a little bit more work as far as moving the certificates to uh, the host where you launch your notebooks. And I can answer some more questions about that later. Um, we also have, uh, so we used crowd, Atlassian's crowd product for single sign-on. Um, so I made a custom authenticator that actually uh, will, it, it implements our SSO. So if I visit from, if I've already logged into one of our other web applications and I visit Jupyter, um, Jupyter will automatically be able to um, recognize that SSO token and start up uh, and, and get ready for that user. Uh, and then there's an SSH spawner that I use to uh, launch notebooks on a remote host. Um, this is actually out uh, and open source as well. I don't believe that was the case the last time I gave this talk. So um, this is also on our GitHub. Um, and as I mentioned here, it's, it's used to spawn over a tunnel, and this allows us to avoid opening a number of high number ports on uh, remote login nodes, um, which I think a lot of centers try, try to avoid, but I can't speak for all of them. So anyway, this, uh, and there's, there's Lawrence Berkeley actually also has a, unfortunately, it's, <laughs> we, we named our spawners the same thing. Uh, we have slightly different goals in each of ours, but the idea is the same. Uh, and then finally, this bridge kernel piece, uh, we're working on um, formalizing as a Jupyter notebook extension, uh, sorry, a Jupyter lab extension, um, so that basically once you've launched a notebook client on a login node, we would present this extension to the user so that they can put in args, our arguments for the underlying resource manager. Uh, for us, that's either Slurm or LSF. Um, and that would start a kernel in, a, in the allocation they requested and eventually link back to the client that they already have running on the login node. So 
this piece, um, this is a piece we're working on finishing formalizing. Um, and then as far as future work goes, um, as I mentioned, we use IPC between the notebook and the kernel. I would like to implement secure TCP sockets. I had talked about this with some folks at the Jupyter Community Workshop. Uh, and I think we have a better idea of, of what to do there. Uh, I just have not had a moment to sit down and focus on that. Um, so pull requests are always welcome. Um, <laughs> and um, I would like to experiment with uh, batch spawner a little bit more. I think that from a UI perspective, I like the, the, the batch spawner would be as either an accompaniment or a replacement to that bridge kernel that I mentioned on the previous page. However, um, I think that from a UI perspective, the, the bridge kernel would work a little bit better because then you're not waiting in the queue for your notebook to actually launch. So um, I think that that's an area of research, but, but perhaps the, the, the solution that I mentioned previously, I think that may be the way we go. Okay, so I know that I covered a lot of ground and uh, at least the last time I gave this presentation, that, that was a good time for <laughs> questions. So happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right. So while people, it looks like we've got some questions coming in. So I'm just going to let the questions queue up while people are typing so that we can get through a few uh, trusted CI related uh, issues. So first, uh, please take our survey. So here we have uh, a Google survey that we set up that uh, we like to use to get some feedback uh, from the community based on um, what you thought of the presentation and also um, topics that you would like to see in the future. So we've got, I just posted the link uh, in the chat because I can't put hyperlinks in the share screen. So if you would like to give us some feedback, please go there. And then um, we have the NSF Cybersecurity Summit, October 15th through 17th in San Diego. This is a reminder to uh, register for the summit. I think we are running out of hotel rooms for the block that we uh, requested. So make sure that if you are attending the summit that you get registered and book your hotel. The agenda is very, very close to being posted. Um, I think they're just putting some polishing touches on it. So keep in mind to be on the lookout for that. Um, also with Trusted CI, our engagement applications are due October 2nd. Um, an engagement with Trusted CI is a uh, approximately six month agreed uh, program or a, a project to work with uh, some other uh, uh, NSF funded uh, organization to help uh, provide security uh, assistance with other, with uh, many different things. It could be uh, training, it could be code review, it could be a security uh, plan uh, assessment. So uh, if you're curious about engaging with Trusted CI, you can go to trustedci.org slash application. Uh, we are accepting applications for the first half of 2020, which means approximately January through June, you would be engaging with Trusted CI, and those applications are due October 2nd. And um, our next webinar is going to be uh, October 28th at 11 Eastern, and the topic is Legal Insights that Impact Cybersecurity Projects. And our speaker is Trusted CI's own Scott Russell. Uh, this presentation will be kind of a, a recap of uh, GDPR and then other issues that are impacting um, cybersecurity with a legal bent to them. And so let's go back to the questions. And actually, I'm going to um, stop sharing and ask Thomas, if you wouldn't mind, just to pull up your presentation again, just in case uh, some of these questions uh, involve uh, specific uh, slides. Okay, so um, we have a training session on Jupiter Security, uh, actually, that will be occurring at the Cybersecurity Summit. Thank you, Jim, for pointing that out. 
and he posted a link here for the training descriptions. Uh, and also the summit is announcing registration for the training sessions, uh, or has announced today actually registration for the training sessions. So be on the lookout for that. Um, here we have a question. Could you clarify how you expose the Jupyter Hub to the internet? Is the Jupyter Hub web server uh, tornado exposed directly to the internet or do you have something in between? Um, and what are the security implications of that? Okay, so yes. Um, so our Jupyter Hub is um, exposed to the internet in, this, uh, in much the same way as all of our other applications. So we actually have a reverse proxy. We're using Nginx that sits in front of um, Jupyter Hub. And actually I've modified that Nginx to do um, single sign-on with, with Crowd. Um, <clears throat> and, and then in front of that, we also have um, a web application firewall that, that keeps it from the broader internet. So we do require log in to that before um, before you could even get to our open Jupyter Hub instance. The other ones are closed off from the, the larger internet. Um, as far as security implications for having a reverse proxy in front of the hub, I think that I think one of the nice parts about setting it up that way is that um, that other component that you don't accidentally expose some of the other components that exist within Jupyter Hub. Um, I mean, you'd have to have those ports open anyway. So, for for instance, Jupyter Hub is composed of this configurable HTTP proxy. Um, there is the Hub API, which I think is also exposed via the configurable proxy, and those are all running on separate ports. But the ones the, the the API components for the hub are really supposed to be private um, and internal to the hub itself. Uh, and so that 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 would be a good place for the for the reverse proxy. I think that that's what I like about that is that I expose only a single port to the front end component of the configurable proxy, and then everything else is just you know tied. Are, are locked down local to the hub host. And further, you know, we, we lock that down via IP tables and make sure that nothing else happens to, to get in there. Um, and yeah, if there's any other concerns there, if anything, <laughs> I, I guess there are some, some concerns as far as deployment goes, um, not, not necessarily security wise, but it does make certain things difficult. Uh, because um, so Jupyter notebooks rely heavily on WebSockets, and not every front-facing proxy, um, uh, not every front-facing proxy uh, exposes that right. So I remember when I was first setting this up. Actually, I, I for the life of me, I kept thinking that I had broken. Jupyter Hub somehow with the changes that I made and I thought, oh no, this will never work. Uh, and come to find out, uh, I was being blocked by one of the higher level uh, web application firewalls is that it would not, it would not let any of that WebSocket traffic through. Um, and in, from an, <clears throat> yeah, so that, that, I guess that's the long, the long and short of it is that the uh, front end proxy is useful to restrict the number of Jupyter components that you happen to be able to hit. So hopefully that answers that. And I also posted links. Um, there was another question on um, can, uh, the links to those open source components. Um, I linked to our gen the Lawrence Livermore National Lab GitHub organization. We've got a number of software projects there, um, but that's where our SSH spawner lives. And the Jupyter Hub changes themselves are actually in the, the main Jupyter Hub repository. Um, and I will say, uh, I don't know if I noted this at the end, it, is that 
you know, part of part of giving this presentation and talking about security for Jupiter Hub is that um, you know I've I've been mostly working on this by myself. Uh, I know that there are a few. I mean, the Jupiter devs have been tremendously helpful with working on this, and I've got some colleagues at Lawrence Berkeley who have also been um, very keen to get some of this stuff set up. Um, but it, you know, this is. I think that this would be a great space for a group effort. Um, I could always use help um, working on these things, like in particular secure TCP sockets. Um, a good solution for that, like, you know, I, I may come up with something, but I know that there are plenty of smart people out there. Um, and so it would be helpful to have, you know, some more eyes on this project so that we can, um, you know, find a, a solution that works really well. Um, so, well, yeah. uh, Thomas, I'll be including the GitHub link uh, in the email that I send out after the presentation is over. Do you want me to include your contact info? Sure. So reach yeah, out to you? Would, that would be great. Okay. Well, why don't we uh, just give people a little bit more time to type in any questions that they may have. Um, but uh, while, while people are typing, I just want to say thank you very much, Thomas, for this presentation. I know that there are a lot of uh, Jupyter Notebook users out there, so I'm sure that uh, as its ubiquity is increasing, there's going to be a lot of questions about the security involved with it. Yeah, no problem. Happy to, happy to do this. And, and like I said, in part, it's you know, this is something I've spent a lot of time on, um, but also it's useful for me because uh, if, if I can find an, uh, other collaborators, that, that always makes my life a little easier too. Um, All right, thank you very much. Um, I think we're wrapped up for questions. Uh, so it, regardless, people could always contact you offline. So again, I want to thank you uh, for all of you for attending this presentation. I'm going to stop recording now.